when I was 20 years old, I stabbed my heroin dealer and I had some really bad people looking for me and I was on probation for a misdemeanor battery. And it was my first, you know, adult crime. I think I had gotten one other one for dying and dashing at IHOP or something petty like that. But the misdemeanor was my first serious charge as an adult and I did some jail time for it. And the way that my attorney had set it up is that I had a year suspended sentence um, when I was on pretty stringent probation at the time, you know, with weekly drug testings, et cetera, et cetera. And I wasn't willing to get off heroin at the time. So I would go, I would literally stay on heroin until I accumulated enough dirty drug tests and they'd throw me in jail. And I started out on the weekends, like, you know, they'd put you in on Friday morning and let you out on Monday. And that happened for like a few months. And then I started catching real sentences, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, 180 days. And it would go in sequential order. And the theory behind it was that they couldn't give you more time than your year suspended sentence. So I think I'd gotten up to like six months, you know, something major. And I was strung out. And I remember I went to court with my mom and with some girl I was dating at the time. And I had gotten like four dirties in a, t- in, you know, in a row. And uh, the judge wasn't having it. And my probation officer was like, yeah, you, you need to go do like a real sentence. Like, I guess six months considered like a real harsh sentence. So he's talking shit to me, you know, the obligatory lecture. And I'm sitting there in court. And I remember I hadn't scored that morning. And I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm sweating. and I'm, I'm sick. And I'm sitting there with my girlfriend and my mom. And I'm knowing that they're about to lay it on me and I'm about to go to jail for like six months. The judge goes, Mr. Leone. And I don't remember what he said like exactly, but it was something to the effect of you're unmanageable or saving your life. You're going to jail for six months. And he told the bailiff, remand Mr. Leone into custody. Literally, I saw the fat cop shuffle towards me. This, you know, quintessential fat, cop with the mustache you know and he's walking towards me and I remember thinking in that moment I'm gonna be dope sick in a cold jail cell in about an hour fuck this I got up and I ran out of the courtroom straight up I mean my mom everyone was kind of bewildered like what the f- it was it was mayhem I mean there's like cops chasing me I think civilians have like seen it seen this little skinny junky scarecrow looking kid just darting out of the courtroom and I think civilians try to you know become vigilantes and try to get me but I made it out and I called one of my friends Jesse and I said hey I'm fucked and remember there's I'd stabbed my drug dealer and he was like you know, like one of these neo-nazi kind of guys they're bad people looking for me. I mean, I stabbed somebody. There's repercussions. I was a kid and I, I think he was like 27. And his friends are the kind of people that would like shoot you or stab you even in a little well, picturesque beach town like Santa Barbara. So I really didn't have a lot of options. I was literally on the run for evading arrest. I had stabbed my drug dealer. My parents were not going to harbor a fugitive. And their deal was like, you need to go to jail. And by that point, they had given up. I mean, I'm going in and out of jail. Every time I get out of jail, I'm on heroin, stealing from them, the whole nine yards. So I ended up going to a sober living house. Not anything. Per- I mean, I, you know, I dabbled in homelessness at that period, but I wasn't cut out for it at the time. And I was manipulative enough to be able to get sober living houses to like, let me stay for, yeah, I get paid in two weeks. And, you know, I'd have a place to stay, which was like the most, you know, secure place I could hide. There were probation officers, cops there all the time. There's no way they would think that someone with the warrant was there. And I would just hide in the dorm. And I knew when probation officers or cops were there because it was an announcement. You're with a bunch of dope fiends. Hey, there's fucking cops here. There's a probation, you know, so... I'd always be warned. And I think I had gotten drunk one night 
or, you know, did drug, did something, a dirty drug test or bad breathalyzer or something where I got asked to leave. There was this fat guy sitting on the step. I, I can, I seriously can remember it like it's yesterday. I was smoking a Pall Mall and he's like, you got kicked out you have nowhere to stay. I can bring you to someone's house. I'm pretty sheltered at this point. I mean, I'd seen basketball diaries, so I'm thinking he might be on some weird male prostitution shit because he's some ugly fat guy taking me to this house in Isla Vista, which is a college town, telling me that I can go stay at someone's house for free and that the guy's in recovery and that he had just lived in the sober living house. I didn't really know what the intentions were, but I assumed the worst, but I just wanted to see what the situation was. And I got there when it was this guy, Alex, um, actually made character and wasting talent who's just a carbon copy of this guy predatory womanizing drug dealer 10 years older than everyone that lived in the college town and was only there to fuck young girls and that was his um, oh he had a stripper pole at his condo um and he sees me this junky kid emaciated it's probably 120 pounds i think i'm 190 now i think i was 120 then you know, festered in track marks, acne, grease, um, pretty much the poster child for bad hygiene at the time. And I smelled like shit and I knew it. And he was just down with me. I don't know why. I guess I th- he, I, he saw me as charismatic and he knew that I was just down, like for whatever, like, you know, he's selling math. Ryan, go give this 20 back to someone. So that, you know, that started my little career as being a runner, giving 20 bags of meth, meeting all these meth whores and just being in this seedy world of crystal methamphetamine while I was a heroin addict. And, you know, that thing happened where you look at tweakers and there's this weird divide between the meth heads and the heroin addicts. There's this like rivalry that's unspoken, but you know, it's there. Ew, you're a tweaker. But it's like, they look at us like, ew, you're a junkie. And it's something that everyone knows about, but very few people talk about, you know? And that's definitely what was going on. Like, the tweakers judged me. <clears throat> but I started doing it, you know? And I started doing the math, you know? And I got immersed in that culture. And speed's just a weird culture. I didn't last too long in it. Um, I think I have underlying mental health issues that were certainly exasperated by IV methamphetamine abuse. Um, I mean, even if you aren't psychotic like me, you stay up for nine days, you will be. So it's double downing on psychosis when you're already psycho to begin with. So I started getting really weird. And I remember Alex had gone out of town. He had gone to San Francisco. And he was picking up, I think he was picking up like a pound of meth or something. And he had left. I told him to leave me a piece on the table. And a piece is 25 grams of heroin. I don't know why I think it's because we're on the metric system, but we get shorted three grams on an ounce. That's everything's in metric. You know, it's 25 grams. It's a piece. It's real like Hispanic shit. You know, like it's 25 grams. It's a palazzo, you know. And I asked him for a piece. And the next day I wake up and I was hanging out with some hood rat girl at the time. I don't, she was a stripper. I don't even think her name was Sugar, some completely obvious name like that. And the next morning I kind of crawl out to the kitchen expecting my little ounce of heroin. And he had left me an ounce of crystal fucking meth. And I was already like, you know, like I said, I was doing it, but I wasn't doing it like that. Like I never had like a whole, ounce to myself heroin coke yeah i had ounces of that stuff before to myself but like meth it really turned me into a fucking weirdo and her and i proceeded to do the ounce and things got weird and there's a lot of lesbian porn and just debaucherous things that occurred in like a three-day period and it's the kind of thing where it seemed like it occurred in like a few hours, but it was a few days. And then we ran out somehow. I mean, we were, I think I was playing Santa Claus with them. We were giving it to all the little meth hoes that she was bringing around. And I remember it was like five, six in the morning. The sun's coming up. And I remember I didn't get my heroin. So I'm getting little half grams, grams, whatever. 
And I go, I'm going to go get more dope. It's like five in the morning in Santa Barbara. And you can't do that in Santa Barbara. And I think it should be said, like if you're in San Francisco, you can go to the Tenderloin at five in the morning, you can get heroin. If you're in Baltimore, you can do that. If you're in fucking New York, you can do that. If you're in Los Angeles, you can go to Skid Row at five in the morning. As soon as the sun comes up, you can get heroin. When the sun goes down, it's harder to get, but you can still find it. You can always sniff out heroin in a big city. Santa Barbara is just simply not that way. It's a hush-hush community full of rich kids and very diluted and sanitized interpretation of the drug culture. But I told her I was going to go get dope. And in my meth psychosis, my plan was I felt that it was a mathematical certainty that somebody in such a large college town had dropped drugs somewhere And if I crawled around on my hands and knees and looked through trash, I would find it. So I'm looking through gum wrappers. I'm looking through little crunched up, you know, pieces of aluminum, thinking I'm going to find that magic gram of heroin or something that somebody dropped. And when you're on meth, you get in these obsessive upswings. And I couldn't stop. You know, I'm crawling around on my hands and knees in Ivy. And... I'm looking through gum wrappers. It was insane. And it carried on into like the morning. Like now it's like 830 in the morning. There's like women in jogging suits jogging by. There's, um, you know, parents with strollers and people doing normal shit. It was probably like a Tuesday morning. I'm the weirdo with raccoon eyes crawling around looking for free heroin that... I thought suddenly would manifest and materialize and it didn't. I was just in full-blown psychosis. And what happened is I had a real moment of clarity. You know, I was 19 years old. And I remember the first time in my life, I was looking at all these normal people and I'm on my hands and knees, just filthy. I smell like shit. Probably been on some weirdo meth sex binge for a few days. And I just had a breakdown and I started crying. And I was like, how did I get here? I have track marks. Three, four years ago, I was like smoking pot in a Volvo. And like those were days when I was pretty happy. I wasn't happy in that moment and I knew it. And back then there weren't, this was like 2004 or five. And there wasn't really the internet on cell phones yet. And that's, back when people used the now totally antiquated 411 system to call information. You know, you press 411 on your phone and they go city and state. And I did that and and I told the operator rehab. She says, well, we need a city and state, sir. And I said, rehab. And I said it with like urgency. Like I need a fucking rehab or I'm probably gonna die. And I probably felt that way. And that momentary just lapse of confidence, I just didn't feel like I had it anymore. You know, like I was falling apart. My life was getting dismantled and I I, I lost control. I think that's control is probably an important word because you either have control of your life or you don't. And I've had both. And in this period, in this moment, it was the first time that I was self-aware that I didn't have it anymore. And it scared the shit out of me. And I think the 401 operator knew that I was desperate. And all of a sudden, like the voice of an angel, some benevolent black woman came on and started calling me honey and sweetie pie, telling me she smoked crack and shit and just making me feel better. And she was a rehab recruiting agent somewhere. And I hadn't talked to someone about recovery probably ever. You know, I'd had it force fed to me throughout the years because I'd always been getting arrested and gone to these kind of de facto drug and alcohol outpatient meetings. And of course, I grew up in institutions for troubled adolescents. So I'd had some exposure to like contrived recovery. But this was my first, you know, this was my first exposure to volunteer recovery where I voluntarily wanted help and I reached out to her and she soothed me and I was crying and I was telling her that 
and I'm addicted to heroin and I'm addicted to meth. My parents have cut me off and no girls want anything to do with me. And if they do, they're girls named Sugar that only hang out with me because I have amphetamines and shit. And I had no friends and I was in trouble and I didn't feel good and I wasn't healthy. I was hungry all the time and nobody cared. You know, it was like the first time when I really felt alone. And she said she was going to help me. And then she asked me for my insurance card. And I had one, you know, I'm still under my parents. I think it was a PPO. I mean, you know, that back then I had good health insurance. I was still young. And she said, give me about 30 minutes to authorize it and I'll call you back. And I went and I sat on a park almost with a sense of relief because I knew that I had made some sort of formal affirmation that I wanted to change. And she called back and said that my insurance would cover it. And I said, well, how much is out of pocket? And she said, $500 a day. And I was like, okay, well, let me go see if someone will pay for me. And at the time, Alex had given me like a little dirt bike that was street legal. So I was like driving around IV in this little motorcycle dirt bike thing, whatever it was. It was kind of like what the kid drove in Terminator 2. I always kind of looked at it like that. Um, and I drove up to their house. I rode up to their house. And, uh, you know, they hadn't seen me for a while. You know, I've been cut off ever since the court debacle. And they let me in. And my parents when they're upset with me, they tend to have meetings <laughs> and they kind of micromanage my life and treat me like a business equation that they have to solve. And we sat there and I told them that I was a drug addict. In particular, I was an IV heroin user and I showed my parents my track marks for the first time. And I think it was, I think it was like a collective moment were like I was showing them track marks and they were acknowledging that I had track marks and like for the first time we were on the same page about how fucked up I was and it like wasn't okay and like I could die and I was asking for help and my parents have never been the kind of parents that say no when I ask them and I'm genuine about it and I told them about this black woman and wherever and I got her on the phone and my dad said pack your shit you're going to Delray Beach, Florida. And I was like, what the fuck? I didn't, for, a, for not even for one second, did it ever cross my mind that I might be leaving <clears throat> and going out of state. But I did, you know, and I, I left. And I hadn't slept for days. I probably really smelled awful. I'm sure that I smelled noticeably bad. And I think my dad had flown me first class. And like the whole deal was you get to Del Rey, you get clean, they fix you. You come turn yourself in and you do the six months in jail. Well, I'm looking at it like, well, this is a good opportunity to get the fuck out of my warrant. And, you know, I'm just going to leave and not have to deal with it. I'll go create a life for me in Florida. So I get to this place and it's called Watershed. And it was the first of many of these capitalistic, I don't even, almost exploitative institutions. They're almost the equivalent, they're $500 a day. And it's, it's almost like a, like a resort. They gave you mud baths and it was just fucking absurd. You know, I'm shooting meth three days before and now I'm taking mud baths on like the Florida coast. But I didn't look at it like that. And I need something at all times. I need a cigarette. I need to do a push-up to feel endorphins. I need a beer in my hand. I need to take a pull off, you know, a beer, or drag off a cigarette. Or I always need something or affection from a woman. And my new obsession became women at rehab because... They were so fucking broken. It was like all of a sudden there was this commonality between me and them. And there was like no buffer anymore. Like I wasn't in society anymore. 
And I said, uh, in Wasting Talent, two dead batteries don't start a car. And that sentence personifies that time period very specifically. I'd go on these predictably, invariably terrible codependent drug runs that would just go up in flames. Hookers I'd meet in rehabs and I'd talk them into boosting shit out of Home Depot. We'd be stealing chainsaws at 8.30 in the morning in Miami and, you know, stealing aluminum and just scumbag shit, right? And that was my pattern. I'd go to rehab. I'd find, like, who I thought was the prettiest or the most damaged. It really didn't matter. As long as they were willing to leave with me and do drugs, we got along for, like, a week and then it would just blow up and implode and it would get like progressively worse. And I started doing this like over and over and over and over and over again. And they would let me back every time into the rehab under the condition that I wouldn't find a girl and, you know, coerce her into going off with me and getting fucking heroin but I would never listen. I'd find a new girl and I'd be off and running. And this went on for months. I probably did this cycle seven, eight times. Really like an insane amount of times, you know? And it got to a point where they kind of pushed me through the program. Um, I ascended these like arbitrary level systems that most institutions impose were like, Oh, you good. You go to this phase and you go to the, it's really ridiculous, you know, socialization, like weirdo programming, but that's institutionalism. And it's something I've become pretty comfortable with over the years. Um, and I don't think I could articulate or even understand it back then, but I can now in retrospect. And what eventually happened is I met a drug dealer. Um, you know, I'd get out of treatment. One thing led to another. I'm, at, I'm getting kicked out of different sober livings. I'm starting to find drugs in the streets of Florida. I meet a guy named TJ, and he sells China white heroin. They don't sell China white in California. They sell black tar here. So China white was like a real treat for a junkie like me. It's always... Pretty much always laced with fentanyl. So the rush is noticeably different. It's all encompassing. It's like this engulfment of pins and needles that black tar just simply doesn't do, you know? Um, and I got really into it and I would, I was doing it out there quite a bit. And it got to a point where like this guy, TJ, I don't really know what was going on with him. But he always had like guys over there. I never saw him with girls. He was always with these really weird guys and they'd be playing like Dungeons and Dragons and like other dorky shit, you know, like Magic the Gathering cards. And like I shot my China White and watched The Simpsons. And that was kind of my trip, you know, and they kind of let me be. And one night, I don't remember the circumstances, but I had gotten into a fight with somebody not like a fist fight. It was like a verbal fight. It might've been with like some girl I was dating or my parents. I can't remember specifically who, but something had triggered a chain of events that night where I was doing too much heroin and I was getting belligerent. And TJ noticed that I was getting belligerent and he like tried to regulate my intake. You know, he's like, you're doing too much. You're getting sloppy. And I was, I was like, I, was, I don't remember who I was fighting with, but I know it was something that made me upset enough where I didn't care. And when I get to that, and when I get to that moment and it's, it happens to this day, that, 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 that real moment of, I don't give a fuck. And it happens in totality with me. And I give in to impulse when I get there, nobody can talk me out of it. And that's where I was that night. I was doing these gargantuan shots, completely unreasonable amounts of heroin, putting them right into my arm. And him and his roommate, or roommate, one of his little dungeon and dragon friends or whatever, they passed out together on a bed. And I went in the bathroom. And at one point, he had confiscated the dope from me. And he hid it. So I had, I think I had a gram. 
And he said, you know, you're getting too fucked up. So he had confiscated. So I'm in the bathroom, you know, trying to do a cotton shot. And I'm like, fuck that. This guy probably hid it in his house. I'm going to find it. So I went on this little junky scavenger hunt at his house. And I find it in a cookie jar. And the fucking irony in it was it like, I think it made me laugh at the time. It's in a fucking cookie jar. And I was like, hell yeah. And I dumped it all in a spoon and I did it. And I fucking woke up in the hospital. And I was in a gown. And I felt like shit because they had injected me with Narcan. And it, which is an opioid fucking antagonist that instantly takes all of the opiate out of your system. So it propels you into this state of like precipitated withdrawal where it's heroin withdrawal on steroids. It's heroin withdrawal with a subwoofer on it. You know, it's a louder version of withdrawal and it's, it's, it fucking sucks. Right. And I really didn't know what happened. And I'm screaming and I'm thrashing and I'm, I think I'm 20 now. I think I turned 20. Yeah, I did. I remember smoking a blunt in the ghetto. Couldn't find heroin that day. And I smoked this shitty weed, saying myself happy birthday a few months before. I'm 20 now. And I was like tyrannical. I was like this tyrant in the hospital screaming at nurses, you dumb bitches. Because I was so sick from withdrawal, right? And they explained to me what happened. They said, listen, two guys brought you in last night, you know, early this morning, four in the morning. You had completely flatlined on heroin and you almost died. And I was like, I don't give a fuck. Get me out of here because I was sick. And that's all I cared about. And I went and I left and I called TJ and he came and he picked me up. He had brought me a loaded syringe because I begged him to on the phone. I knew his phone number by heart, I think, you know, and I had called him, I think, on a pay phone. And I was, and he was telling me I almost died, and I'm just like, give me a, I need a shot. So TJ comes and picks me up, preloaded syringe. I do the shot, and he starts telling me what happened. Says, you're really lucky to be alive, and let me tell you why. I have two phones, is what he's telling me. I have two phones. I have a landline and I have a cell phone. All of my dope fiend customers call my cell phone. My landline is only telemarketers and my ex-girlfriend. I was like, ex-girlfriend? That's how far removed I was. I was, I think, I was thought the dude was gay. And he's telling me his ex-girl. He's telling me about how my life was saved. And all I cared about was like, damn, I thought this fool was gay. But he, you know, I mean, he said he had a girlfriend, whatever. So he said that she happened to call at like 3.45, 3.50 in the morning, whatever it was, super late, panicky about something. I think someone had died or some crazy event had happened that had had her call. It wasn't a drug thing. And she never called him on that line unless it was an emergency. And she happened to call. It woke them up. They went into the bathroom and they found me face down with a, with a, with a fucking needle in my arm that had broken. So there was just blood leaking out of my arm. And they said that I had gone, you know, like a fish scale, whitish blue, almost complete death. I mean, they thought I was dead. They said I was cold and the whole nine yards. So. He's telling me this, and the only thing I can think is, oh, fuck, he's not gay. That's insane. Like, I, I was, I was, I, I could have sworn he was, you know. It's like shit that I talked about with other people all the time. And the death thing, I was so fucking flippant about it because I had no concept of it. Just like money. I had no concept of money at that time. I just didn't. These, 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 these basic yet grand concepts in life were completely elusive to me at that point. And I, I just couldn't internalize the depth and meaning and expansiveness of simple mechanisms that control your entire life. It took me years to really understand that about myself, but then I didn't. And I'm telling it, I'm high now, I'm talking my normal shit, high, feeling confident, feeling, you know, I had returned to normality 
And I thought we were going to his place. And instead he drives me to the, the goddamn rehab. I'm like, what, what are you doing? And he's like, you're going to die. I'm like, that's rich coming from my fucking heroin dealer. I mean, aren't you going to lose money off me going to recovery? I'm not going to pay you for dope I'm not getting in there. And he's like, it's way beyond that. You're a human being. Like, I don't even consider you a friend, but I don't want to see you die. And you're on that trajectory right now. Do yourself a favor, go to rehab. So I go in there and they say, nope, you're not coming in. You're going you're gonna to find a woman. You're going to go out. You're going to do this and that. And I was like, okay, I, didn't, I don't want to go anywhere. Um, but I had no option. I, at that point, I think I was living with, D- I was, I was, I was staying that with DJ, like, uh, you know, full time. So I called my dad and I told him I OD'd. And again, the reason I talked about it earlier is because I had that flippancy about how I told him about the overdose. I was flippant about it. Stoic, apathetic, like I overdosed last night in monotone, right? And he's like, I mean, that's, I almost died. That's tragic to him. My heartbeat almost stopped. A heartbeat that he probably had heard in ultrasounds and it made him really excited about all the possibilities of what I was going to turn into. And this is what I turned into. Something that just completely had a complete and gross disregard for my own life and the life of everyone around me. And it was disgusting, you know. But I went back to rehab. He talked, he, he insisted and he talked these people into it. And I went back and I told myself, you know, I don't know. I think I felt bad. I think my conscience started talking to me. You know, I had moments throughout my years of trying recovery where I did gain some spirituality for a moment. And I used that spirituality to really like decode or demystify things that were keeping me from understanding greater concepts. And I went and I tried and I applied myself. No, no, no girls. No, I'm going to take it seriously. Well, I met a fucking girl and her name was Megan and she was two years older than me and she was a nurse from Knoxville, Tennessee. And she had all these stories and we connected over really avant-garde French horror films that nobody else had ever fucking heard of. I thought she was a cool artsy chick. She was a couple years older. She had this great story about how her husband was in Iraq and had like cheated on her. And she was like this feminist that had fucking left him because she's not, she's not going to stand for him cheating, you know, and usually it's the other way around when someone's in Iraq and she just, she really was emblematic of a more mature woman. I was used to these little hood rat drug addict girls. Her whole story is she was going through a divorce she was a full-time nurse. She had gotten into the Oxycontin stash and become a junkie by default. Like, not like me, who immersed himself in the drug culture and started listening to the Velvet Underground and reading Burroughs and thinking that that shit was cool when it wasn't. She was like, by mistake. And I always had like this weird solidarity yet respect for someone that got into it by mistake you know, unwillingly. It was almost like, you it, know, it, it, it was unequivocally more tragic than what I had done because I had chosen this path and it seemed that she hadn't. But I'll get more, you know, into that later. We started out with a little courtship in there. Typical rehab playbook. Poems, hand-holding little notes that said, do you like me with the three boxes? Yes, no, maybe, you know, shit that would emulate cute stuff from your elementary school days where it was like when you had a crush on a girl and you let them know because you were the only dude that had the balls to do it. And it was that kind of stuff. And she wouldn't have sex with me. And we were doing really good together, just kissing, holding hands, Everything pretty innocent. About a month into it, I mean, we're doing it. We're going to AA meetings. We're we're really doing the program. 
I got a sponsor. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about God. I'm trying to transcend my devout agnosticism. And she says, let's leave. Everything I just said instantaneously went out the window. I said, fuck yeah, let's go. And she said, let's bring Allison with us. Allison was like the second prettiest girl at the rehab. And it's probably like three in the afternoon when we actually left. And we had just, we, there was no formal planning. We just grabbed our suitcases and we started leaving and the staff started pleading with them. No, don't leave with him. He's a fucking piece of shit. We put our our middle fingers up. We put our middle fingers up and we said, fuck you. We're not going to be indoctrinated by your radical cult shit anymore. It was like a real grand moment of like defiancy. And this was the worst nightmare for the rehab. Now I'm taking two girls out. It was just like I had evolved in my dirt bagness to them. I mean... It was almost like a, like a higher budget sequel. Like I'd been going and taking girls out. Now I got two and it was like the prettiest ones there. And I was like, later, I'm good. This little acne face, you know, gauntly 20 year old with just a completely arrogant guy. You know, that was me back then. And I could not make this up. We walk one block down the street And we see TJ and his Dungeon and Dragon friend in his Cadillac. They're stopped at a red light. It was unfucking believable The first five minutes were out of rehab. I see my dope dealer. He sees me with two pretty girls. We flag him down. And remember, I know he's not gay now, so he's about it. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to play this to my advantage. I fucking flag him down like a taxi. He sees me with these two girls. He swoops us up or with his other friend. They had like natty light in the back seat. We'd been clean like 40 days. He's offering us beer and we're drinking them. And the girls have like two or three and they're like shit faced. They're, you know, pretending they are whatever girls do when they're not as drunk as they say they are. But I had like, you know, five or six and I was buzzed too. You know, when we get back to TJ's place and I don't know what sort of, I know that girl, Allison, that we had brought Megan's friend. She was an internet porn star. She did webcam porn. And I don't know what kind of weird unspoken shit had happened between her and Dungeons and Dragons, but they go in the other room for like 30 minutes. And while they're in there, TJ says to me, do you want a shot for old times? Of of course I want. I just, of course. I mean, that goes without saying. And he cooks me up some China white heroin. And he takes a little piece off of a cigarette filter. And he sticks the insulin syringe right in the cotton. And he draws me up one. And I do it. And I get loaded. Like back then when you got loaded, it counted. You know, it doesn't do that to me anymore. It makes me grouchy and itchy and it makes me not be able to fuck anymore. But back then, it was blissful. It was the way the movies portray it. And that's what it was like in that moment there. And Megan saw it and she was an Oxycontin addict and she was fucking down. She wanted to try it. Now, I'd made it a rule throughout my years as a heroin addict. Now, I've broken the rule several times. It doesn't mean that there wasn't a rule that was kind of, you know, arbitrarily placed in my set of, uh, you know, warped ideals or principles, but I had made it a point to try to not turn people on to IV heroin use. And I said straight up, no, I'm not going to do that to you. And TJ said, I will. And he made her a shot and he stuck it in her arm and she pulled one of those things where it was, you know, her first exposure to a needle and most women or most anyone that gets a shot for the first time looks away. They pull one of those, they stick the arm out, they put their side to the head and, uh, you know, their head to the side. I mean, they they stick their arm out and put their head to the side and they do the shot. And her face instantly went into that frown smile negotiation that means you're high. And she was high, it worked. Well, Allison comes out Moments after that, hair frizzy. She just got fucked by this guy. It's it's clear. 
and she sees us and we're loaded. We're loaded like the first scene of train spotting where dudes are kissing each other because we're so high, you know, listening to like Walk on the Wild Side, the Lou Reed song. Like that's what that that's like what the room looked like. And that's what we're listening to in the moment. And Allison said, I want to try it. And she was a tweaker from Texas. And again, I said no. And uh, Dungeon and Dungeons and Dragons was the one that gave it to her. And he said, yeah, I got you. And he gives it to her. And I watch the plunger go down. And as the plunger go down, I see her fold forward. And I see her torpedo towards the carpet. She hits her head. I mean, it was loud. I mean, she, she folded onto the floor. And you got to remember, TJ and Dungeons and Dragons had just seen me overdose a month or so before that. So, you know, and when you're, when you're doing IV heroin, this kind of shit becomes blasé. People OD, people go out, there's home remedies. You can stick ice cubes up people's asses to shock the system. You can shoot people up with salt water. You can shoot people up with amphetamine or cocaine. You can do Narcan, you know, you can uh, do other opiate antagonists like Naltrexone that'll get it out of your system. But if you don't have any of that shit, a cold shower is the way to go. And that's what we did. You know, they're freaking out. She's going to die. She's going to die. I'm like, she's not going to die. I'm, I'm the voice of reason because I'm so high that I probably in that moment didn't have the kind of emotional investment I would have if I was sober. I certainly didn't, looking back. We take her into the shower. We hit her with the cold shower. Nothing. She's unresponsive. Dungeon, Dungeons and Dragons, he... Uh, He's really having a hard time with this. You can't die on me, you fucking bitch. And he's hitting her. And I mean, he's hitting her like close fist, you know, like in the face. And to the point where she's bleeding, to the point where we hear a crunch and her nose breaks, to the point where I stop him. Little scrawny me, I'm like, what are you doing? He was drunk and it was rage. And he had some of that Southern mentality where violence comes out with alcohol intake. It seems to be pretty standard down there, you know, and I try to give her CPR as like a last ditch effort. We had had the ice cubes out now and I go, there's blood coming, streaming out of her nose. And when I go down to give her CPR, she's not breathing. And I was definitely the first person that acknowledged that she was dead. Maybe 15 minutes had gone by, I was like, she's dead. And uh, there was silence. Like there was no panic. There was just silence and unison. You know, a collective hush. And then Dungeons and Dragons said, I came in her without a condom. And it looked horrible. We had a girl that was dead from a, ho a heroin overdose. She had a broken nose. She's bleeding. And she had someone's cum inside of her. And in Florida, the laws are completely illogical. Um, if you call 911 because someone OD'd, you become an accessory. It's like some form of manslaughter out there. And this is a state, keep in mind, that's essentially a pill mill. It, it has one of the, the worst prescription drug problems in the world, arguably. Uh, big opiate dependent state, very conservative, draconian, frightening. It's frighteningly conservative out there. And it, it, it's very indicative of what conservative politics look like in action. And if they ultimately get that totalitarianism that they've mastered in Florida, what the rest of the country would look like, an actual police state, just to preface it with the atmosphere that we were, that we were you know, trying to navigate inside of, with all that kept in mind. If we get caught with this body, we're going to prison over this. So 
I came up with an idea and I said, okay, it's what we're going to do. Let's clean her up. Let's get the blood off. Let's put makeup on her, dry her hair, put new clothes on her. Remember we had her luggage. We had been drinking the Natty Light and what, you know, we'd probably accumulated 18, 20 empty cans. So my theory was that if we carry her, TJ, Dungeons and Dragons and I, and we have Megan behind us with a box with beer cans in it that are empty. Nobody's going to think, dead girl. Anyone that sees us is going to think, dumb drunk bitch. Because that's what you think of at that age when you see a girl passed out. Now, we're getting smarter about that as a country. And rape culture is certainly a reality and it's something we're more hyper aware of and there's a lot of hysteria around it but back then and for that age that was something that was a realistic way to go unnoticed and tj's apartment was three stories so we had to take her from the top of the three-story complex down to the parking lot we didn't see anybody the way that the apartment, it was in West Palm Beach, the way that the apartment was set up was there was a parking lot with a meadow. <sighs> then after the meadow, there was a street and across the street, there was a 7-Eleven. We literally went and dumped her body in the meadow. I remember closing her eyes for her with my fingers. And before we had dumped her, we had to do something about the cum, the sperm that was inside of her so that it wasn't going to look like some rape case because that's really what it looked like. I mean, circumstantially, it looked horrible. And Megan was a nurse. So I convinced her to use herbal essence shampoo and scrub the cum out of Allison's pussy. And she was dead. And I literally had to watch it like it was a scene manufactured in some horror factory. As Megan did it with one hand, suds came out and she was crying, cleaning sperm out of her dead friend's vagina. Completely symbolic of some morbid cycle of life that I still can't understand because it's so layered in metaphor, but something that's never left me. And we dump her in the meadow after all that. You know, we did the herbal essence thing up in the bathroom. I just forgot to mention it. We run across the street and like all of us do, and we don't really know what to do. And I remember I called 911 for no reason. I don't, to this day, I don't know why I did that. And I placed a 911 call and I said, our friend overdosed on heroin. This is where she is. I didn't give an address or anything. And I just hung the fucking phone up. Didn't know what to do. Then we walk over to TJ's car. Dungeons and Dragons is freaking the fuck out. Like to the point where I was like, damn, dude, did you rape her? Like, why are you, you know, like, what's up? We're all just as guilty as you and guilty of something that shouldn't be a fucking crime. This is a medical issue, period. You know, if somebody's in trouble because of an overdose, if my child has overdosed on drugs, I want them to have the right to call 911 without any criminal entanglement. That's sensible policy, and it's non-existent in a conservative state like Florida. We don't know what to do, right? So we're driving around, and he wants to get me out of town, and he ends up bringing me to a Best Western me and Megan. Now it's like midnight at this point. We had been picked up at three o'clock by him around that time. It's like midnight now. I don't have a dollar on my name. Megan doesn't have a dollar. We got wallets and we got IDs. We don't have any money. We're degenerates, you know? Um, and he drops us off at a Best Western. Like, that's some fucking beacon for safety. I, I mean, we didn't have money. And I tried to tell him, like, what the f- It's fucking midnight, man. What do you know? Like, 
really setting us up for a homeless adventure in Florida is what I thought. That was my first take on it. But my girlfriend at the time, Megan, she had a really persuasive Southern drawl. And she's like, let me call your dad. I was like, I cannot call my dad. First, we didn't even have money. We had to call him fucking collect. You know, my dad only gets collect calls for me if I leave rehab or I'm in fucking jail. And both of them happen so frequently that I'm petrified to make either one of those calls. And it was the latter. I'd left rehab for like the 13th or 14th time, a spot that was like $500 a day. The uh, just blatant disregard for his financial commitment, for his commitment emotionally is disgusting to look back on. In hindsight, it disgusts me. But this is who I was back then. Somebody sick and disease, right? You know, not thinking about it. I'm thinking about the moment. We call my dad and she says, Hi, Frank. This is Megan. And that's all I heard. I don't, I, yeah, I'm the kind of guy that paces all the time. You know, I paced. I don't know what the fuck she was saying. I didn't care. All I know is that when she got off the phone with him, miraculously, she had convinced him to fax the best Western his credit card. And we got a place for seven days. She explained to me that he, you know, that she told him, I'm a nurse. I'm from Tennessee. I own a house from a divorce. We just need a week until we, and he can come live with me in Knoxville. And I think my dad was like, thank God somebody's inheriting my problem. I cannot facilitate his wildness any longer. It's getting to be absurd. Ridiculous. So the next, so we get in the Best Western and you know, he had faxed a credit card and reserved a room for us for a week. We had a week. The next morning, I started like a true professional dope fiend. Woke up early. It's funny because like I do things professionally now that I have a hard time waking up for. But back then I could wake up early if it was part of like some scheme to get heroin. That's just so paradoxical that it's hard for me to do professional obligations. But when heroin's involved, I am have efficacy. I have unmatched professionalism and I get it done. The next morning I woke up early. I went to uh, Walmart and I boosted $600 worth of clothes. What I would do is I was wearing a 32 by 30 at the time. And I would go put a bunch of those on. And then I would go up in sequential order up to about 40 with a belt. And I could get enough jeans and enough flannel shirts to walk out of there with $600. Now, the way it works in Florida, I don't know if it still works, but the boosting strategy in 05, anyhow, and it was like pretty universally understood by the Florida drug addicts at the time was like, you could go to Walmart and then you could go to Super Walmart and you could return the shit without a receipt and they give you a gift card. Now, Florida was so drug addict friendly and within the, you know, within the inner commerce of the city that pawn shops, every single pawn shop would give you 50 cents on the dollar for a fucking gift card. So it was like literally engineered for drug addicts to boost shit and then be able, and they were essentially their friends, right? So every day we do the same thing. We go to Walmart, super Walmart, you know, get the gift card. Then we go to a pawn shop of our choice. We learned about this one that was in this bad area in, in uh, Lake Worth. Lake Worth's where you get heroin in that area. They sell caps, like these little pill capsules that are filled with this brownstone heroin. It's just complete garbage, by the way. Um, yeah, Florida's got like some of the worst heroin ever. And that's like, you know, um, you know, TJ had that China white, but that stuff in Lake Worth and what I found in Miami and uh, down in Bradenton and in the Keys and all over, it was just junk, right? Anyway, um, we got a real routine. We would boost enough for cigarettes, pizza, heroin, and crack. 
Megan didn't smoke crack. She was like on her high horse, but she did shoot heroin. And we're still kind of reeling about Allison's death. We haven't talked about it, which is interesting. I mean, someone we were friends with, we were in rehab with her for like 40 days. Had like died, like in our hands. And we simply didn't process it. Now, I don't know if that's indicative of our naivety our general sense of passivity or just our immaturity or just simply being addicted to heroin where you don't give a fuck about anything but it was something like that (laughs) and I still don't know the answer but we didn't talk about it and what had happened is we're there for about you know we get caught up in the cycle of boosting, of eating, of fucking, of doing drugs. The shit that every drug addict couple's doing in motels all over the country right now, right at this moment, I guarantee you there's a couple doing exactly what I'm telling you about. Guaranteed. Go to any motel, this is going on there. People have old pizza boxes. People are stealing shit to get heroin. And people are living in motels watching celebrity rehab while they get loaded, period. Well, this guy had called us from our rehab. His name was Kevin. Kevin called. And he said that he found out his wife was cheating on him while he was in rehab. He was irate. He knew that Megan and I had relapsed. He knew that Allison had died. And he asked me to procure some heroin for him. Now, just because I was boosting doesn't mean that I wasn't trying to come up middlemanning because that's always a play for a heroin addict. Yeah, give me a hundred dollars, give him thirty dollars worth. He's in a relapse. He'll be happy to just get anything. It doesn't matter if it's a hundred or if it's fucking ten dollars worth. He's gonna be just as happy because he's getting loaded. He's not paying for that quantity. He's paying for that substance, no matter how little or how much. It's the same thing that he's paying for, a relapse. And I knew that, and every junkie knows that. And so I had him come over, and it was the same goddamn thing with me the night I OD'd with with TJ. He was doing too much. And I was telling him, hey, man, Allison died. You know, Megan and I were cuddled up in the the bed. He's going in the bathroom. I'm having to babysit him. It was, you know, not worth the however much money I made off him. It certainly wasn't worth it. I wanted him gone. And then we hear nothing. We do not hear anything from him. Megan's like, you think he's dead in there? I was like, fuck, I hope not. And we go and he is, you know, the the door was locked. And I remember I had to use a clothes hanger in the closet to pick the lock. And I see him folded over the toilet with the fucking spike in his arm and I'm like are you like are you kidding me like I OD'd then Allison OD'd and now this guy Kevin OD'd you know I mean it's not that hard to believe it's heroin you know I mean you know this comes with the territory but it's you know it's, it was a lot in a short period of time you know and so I'm telling her we got to do this we got to do that I'm bringing up the ice cubes I'm saying we got to do the shower Go get me ice cubes, Megan. I ain't leaving him. What do you mean? I'll go get him. You're not leaving me with him. Well, what the fuck? You know, typical ineffectual panic talk that just doesn't make the situation better. And her plan was to bring his OD body outside of our hotel room. And it's the only thing I could get her to agree with. And in that moment of irrationality, I agreed to it. And we dragged this guy out of the hotel room. This OD body that could get us busted. I mean, fuck, he's dead. You know, that's how you have to look at it. He's dead. And the same conservative, fucked up Florida state that I was just describing earlier. And we did it. We drag him to the ice machine. And I had to stick ice cubes up his hairy asshole in his dunk. The ice cubes literally, like, opened up some, like, avalanche of nasty wretched pores of shit smell and I'm already loaded so it's 
already not a good situation to smell, but I think heroin like amplifies the shitty smell, right? And I'm sitting there and it's disgusting and I'm covered in melty ice shit. And I felt like a, like some weird dystopian parent on some foreign planet doing... I, it was bizarre. And all of a sudden this guy comes and he's wearing a Yankees cap and he's got like the worst acne pox scars I've ever seen, right? And he's got this thick accent and he's like, yo, that guy OD on heroin. Straight up, like who the fuck says that, right? And I looked at him, I said, yep. And as a matter of fact, he did. He's like, you do CPR yet? I'm like, no. And this dude, I felt like I was watching that old show Rescue 911. I mean, he went down and was performing like CPR fucking ballet or something. It was beautiful how well he knew it. He's playing him like a fucking instrument, you know? And he comes back to life. And I kick him, I get the fuck out of here. I told you, that's what I tell him. And he leaves. This guy looks at me. The guy with the pock marks, the guy with the Yankees cap. And he looks at me and he goes, my name is Mike Virgin. Straight up said that. It was so weird, right? My name is Mike Virgin. Do you guys smoke crack? I, yeah, I do some, what's up? And he pulls out a, like a cookie, like 600 bucks worth of like ghetto ass, like crack cookie, you know, like, like a fucking hockey puck crack, you know? Um, and you know, Megan looks at me, oh God, cause she wasn't into the crack, you know, like the crack thing. It's it, people are so weird, you know, shooting heroin. That's fine. That's almost like rock star. Like there's something cool about it. There's something chic about it, but crack, like crack, you're the, you're, you, Dave Chappelle's making fun of you. You know, you got white shit on your lips and you're you know, wearing beanies and you're putting your hands over fires and you're a bum, you're a crack, you're a fucking crackhead. You suck dick for drugs if you smoke crack. That is the connotation that goes with that word. And she felt above it, even though she's shooting sandstone heroin into her fucking little ankles each night, but whatever, right? I I bring him in my room and we binge out. And it was like, the thing with crack smoking is crack is not a social drug at all. It starts social, and after the first hit, it's not. Because people want to talk, just like with snorting cocaine. They want to tell you their dreams and their fantasies and how they were going to be the best pitcher in the fucking professional baseball circuit. And then you see them the following weekend at a party, and they're, like, embarrassed, you know, that they revealed some lame delusions from their past that, like, got uncovered from the cocaine. Crack is worse, right? And... It's like the delusions are weirder. You know, you you start getting on some real weird shit. You know, I wanted to be an eyebrow model at one point in my life. And people are like, what the fuck are you talking about? And when you smoke crack with someone, you don't care what they're saying. You're just watching them smoke and just praying to God they give you the fucking tube and shut the fuck up. Don't care about what they're saying. And so that's what happened. We were in this foggy crack den hotel room and the the phone starts ringing and everyone looks at it you know megan's not on crack but she's certainly putting in crack hours so it's like 7 30 8 9 whatever it is in the morning it's early we've been smoking crack staying up all night the whole room's foggy and just you know incensed by chemical and acetone and ether and all the nasty shits and crack cocaine and the phone rings and it's like that unspoken, do not answer that phone. And of course, I'm like the kind of guy that just wants to know what's up instead of just, I don't want to trip on what it could have been. So I pick it up, you know. Hello, uh, Mr. Leone, this is the front desk. Check out times at 1130. Your father is no longer paying for the room after today. And I'm like, fuck, it's been a week. We had no plans to go to not. We didn't have, I mean, it was heroin, pizza, sex, whatever TV shows we were following at the time, maybe lost, you know? And that was it. Those were like my responsibilities in that moment. Boosting too in the mornings. Um, And like I I announced my my dilemma to the room. I'm like, hey, we gotta go. 
Megan's like, oh God, what are we going to do? She gets all dramatic and Southern, you know? And Mike Virgin, this crack smoking chimney monster that's just been in my room in a Yankees hat. Like I haven't even, I don't think he's spoken in six hours. I got a place you guys can stay. And we like both look at him. He's like, yeah, I got a spot. I got to go to work right now. But when I get off work, I'll have my buddy pick you up. Megan and I look at each other. Now, this should be noted. I'm sober as I'm telling you this right now. But even in my crack delusional state, I felt something off about this. Like we're in a room in the Best Western smoking crack with this guy, this like CPR whisperer guy. He's like the horse whisperer of like drug overdoses, you know? And he's telling us that we can come stay with him for free. It was like winning a junkie scratcher ticket or something. And we, I, we both felt like something was off, but we had no other option, so we did it. So we go down to the lobby center, you know what I mean? His friend would pick us up around one or whatever. Of course, nobody shows up. And we're like, eh, well, yeah, he was on crack. He's not anymore. And he said something and now he's not going to come through. Typical drug addict shit. Then all of a sudden a limo pulls up and it's being driven by a guy that looks like Biggie Smalls. And he literally rolls the window down and says, Ryan and Megan. And we're like, yeah. He's like, yo, I'm Eddie. Max Trapper. We're like, what? And he got, he, I swear to God, he parked the limo. Took our, like, got out and, like, took our luggage and put it in the trunk, like a straight up, like, limo service. Got it, open the door for us so we get in the back. And he had champagne shoved on ice. And I'd been smoking crack all day. I was so stoked to see the champagne you know I felt like shit I needed the edge to come off you know and I'm sitting there pounding champagne and his little window's up so we can't talk to him and I knock on it as I'm you know I got a bottle of champagne in one hand I'm like what's up he's all yo how you doing where you from you from LA dog I'm like no 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 I'm from Santa Barbara you know back then I didn't realize that like there is no Santa Barbara to people in other parts of the country. There's LA and San Francisco and San Diego and maybe Orange County, but Santa Barbara, it's like people don't, you know, it's not everyone knows what that is. You know, that's how like elementary I was back then. I was not worldly, you know, whatever is um, the antonym of worldly. That's me sheltered. I was sheltered and I go, so you're good friends with Mike? I was, oh yeah, Mike a good dude. He's not going to be there though. I'm like, what? What do you mean? I was, oh, he's out of town for a few days, but he wanted me to give you this dog. Yo, you got this. And he gives me an envelope. And like, it's getting weirder and fucking weirder by the second. And he gives me an envelope and it's sealed. And it doesn't say anything. It's just a white envelope. And I open it and there's a key to, the, to uh, like a place and there's a thousand dollars cash and hundred dollar bills. And I'm like, what the fuck? Right. And I'm expecting, we met this crackhead at the Best West. I'm expecting like some real crackhead shit. Like I'm ready for like whatever the fuck I'm going to see. Like people that brought boosted nitrous oxide tanks from dental offices or something, you know, shit like that. Uh, some weird like factory where people are just like manufacturing like counterfeit money or you know some real crackhead shit that's what I thought I was going to maybe some sophisticated crackhead because best western kind of shows where you're at socioeconomically it's definitely a few pay grades above what the, the typical crackhead would be at and we get to this lavish high-end complex rolling green hills it's like ten, you know uh golf golf courses it's like a golf course condo in like west palm beach it's gorgeous like this is where mike lives eddie's like oh yeah he do real good and i got a thousand dollars cash and i got a key 
I did think something was weird though. I just, I, I, I do have to preface it with saying, I like intuitively my spider sense was definitely going off. And I was just like, whoa, okay. Golf courses, crack, best Western, thousand dollars in a key. And, you know, it was weird. So, you know, his, his condo was like 205 or something. It was like, you know, but it was upstairs. And so we go to it and inside the condo, Eddie left us, right? He's like, yeah, you guys got the cash. Here's my number. He wrote his number on the envelope and we go in the condo and it was one of the weirdest condo lands I've ever seen, by the way. It was a bedroom, a kitchen, a living room and a bedroom, but the living room didn't look like a living room. It looked like a bedroom with a bed, with dressers. It looked like a third room. So what it looked like was three bedrooms in a row with the kitchen. In the living room bedroom, there was a tripod with a camera just pointed towards the bed. And I instantly knew that he recorded some sort of fucking porn or he was into some weirdo shit. I, I think Hostel had come out around that time. And I, in my imagination, always would run wild about stuff like this. And this is one of those perfect scenarios where somebody probably could have gotten a hold of us with a blowtorch. I mean, it's the perfect setup for that. So I was, I was aware that I, was, I could be going into a bad situation. And we're looking, and it's a nice place. And on the refrigerator, there's a note that says, Ryan and Megan, make yourselves at home. I stocked the refrigerator for you, and I left a little present in my bedroom. My bedroom's the one with the leopard print. So first I look in the refrigerator. It was insane. And he had like all these like high-end beers. This is before IPAs were like a thing. So it was like, what a, it was like Heineken, but like to me, at like 20, that was like some really high class beer, you know, Guinness, shit like that. You know, like I thought I was like doing shit. I was used to drinking old English or, you know, uh, King Cobra or uh, Colt 45, you know, all these just punk ass mall liquors, Mickey, you know, stuff that I had grown up in high school with when, when our parents gave us $5 for lunch money and we spent half of it on weed, another half on a 40. That, that's what I was used to, not drinking Heineken. Not to say that I'm proud of that, uh, you know, that status boost that had occurred from Mickey's to Heineken. I mean, it's nothing even to acknowledge. I'm just saying I was impressed that he had some like okay beer. And we went to his room, the leopard print. It was weird as fuck. I mean, leopard print room, it just looked tacky. Went to his computer and he had a couple ounces of pot and he had like maybe 400 methadone wafers. You don't see a methadone wafers that often in California, but they're these white almost. They're like the size of a quarter almost. A quarter, like a coin. There's these white wafers that like powderize very easily and you can like put it in your orange juice and if you're not like if you don't have a heroin habit and you take a 40 milligram wafer you're fucking loaded for like 24 hours and it's incredible i don't recommend it but that's pretty you know in vogue in florida it was in 05 so just to recap he had given us a thousand dollars cash, a key. We had no idea when he was coming back. We just got a limo there and we had steaks and beer and pot and methadone and money in case we wanted like other drugs, but we were cool. We started binging out on methadone. We started barbecuing. We started fucking smoking joints and living quite lavishly for a couple dope fiends that just found the situation. It quite honestly felt like something good at the time. And then he came back and that's when shit got weird and he comes back and he's in a Hawaiian shirt and he's covered in sweat. I mean, the guy's spinning on crack and he had girls with him. He had like six of them. And I remember Megan and I, we had just finished smoking a cigarette on the balcony. We come back in. And he had come in with these girls and there was like six of them. And I remember looking at him and I'm like, damn, these girls are young. 
I mean, some of them had retainers. We're talking like 11, 12, 13, maybe 15 was like the old. I didn't even, you know what? 14 was like the cap. And, you know, my immediate thought was like, these were like his cousins or something. But then I saw him giving him a crack tube. And it's not like I was Captain Moral at the time. Like I was going to blow some fucking whistle on it and be like, you're fucked up. But I would now. I'm patently against that. But back then, it was almost like I just had blinders on. Like, I'm getting free drugs. I can look past almost anything, you know? And I really, I didn't put it all together at first, but he was being weird, you know? And he's smoking crack, like blast after blast. I mean, really like impressive crack smoking. Like the kind where you're like, you know, I have a problem, but that guy's really fucked up. Wow. And you start judging him, and shit, you know? And, and that's what was happening. But I'm noticing he's turning these younger girls out. And Megan... I think had transitioned into crack around that time. I mean, I know she did ultimately in that period, but I think this is right when it happened, when she's seeing, you know, essentially fifth graders taking booyah blasts and she's like, wow, that looks fun. And I think in a sense, you'd given up. I mean, when you're smoking crack with 11 year olds, you suck at life. I don't care how you look at it. You're not doing well. And, um, so the way that it works and I had asked Mike, I said, well, who are these girls? He said, those are my girls. I pimp them out. And again, I wasn't on any, my, my morals were like, what morals? And I was like, okay, whatever. He's like, yeah, you got food, drugs, come and just chill. You're not doing anything. Okay. You know? So, The way that it would work is Eddie, the limo driver, would come back. The girls would go on a date in that living room, that kind of like, you know, makeshift room that I told you about earlier. And girls would have sex with older men, like creepy dudes, like greasy Persian guys that wear like those chains with like a silver dollar medallion on them, like straight up Florida people. You know, they have like the weird Oakleys that they don't even make anymore. And they wear like straight up Florida tourist clothes, even though they live there, that kind of demographic, you know, and it just got to be routine because now Megan smoking crack were completely enveloped in delusion. We're smoking crack with children with a crackhead king pimp and some black limo driver that has a gun in his waistline that listens at the door. All these younger crackheads who are probably high, you know, like little runaways from like all over the country are getting fucked by old perverts that make videos with them, essentially making kitty porn. I mean, that is what they were doing. But we were way too in the fog of crack to even acknowledge that. That's how far fucking removed we were, right? And I remember things started getting weird very quickly. I mean, with those ingredients, I don't see how it couldn't be inevitable for things to get bizarre. But they did. And... I went out one morning to get a beer, not outside of the house, because you got to remember when you're in the throes of crack addiction, you don't leave. You don't even know what that fucking means. Unless it's to get drugs, your home is a fucking cave and you're responsible for almost getting food within that cave without leaving. And you start strategizing it and figuring out ways for it to be delivered. And you just anything possible not to leave a crack run and being inside is how you facilitate one. So we didn't leave. So one day I'm leaving, um, you know, his bedroom just to go to the refrigerator to get beer. That was like as far as I would travel there, the porch of smoke. And I didn't even like doing that. It was creepy seeing reality out on the balcony, you know. And I go out there, there's a fucking cop. There's a police officer, like a, a police officer in uniform. And like I'm walking, you gotta remember I'm smoking crack. And I look and there's a cop watching me and he's pulling his pants up too so it's not just like he's there it's like he's on some weirdo shit 
this shit I don't even want to know about, you know? And I walk, and the whole time I'm walking to the refrigerator, I'm looking at him because he's a fucking cop. What, what respectable crackhead wouldn't be tripping out at that point that there's a cop that nobody mentioned? He's just there looking at me while I'm drinking. And I'm drinking the beer. I never stop looking at him, and he never stops looking at me. He doesn't even acknowledge my existence. And I go back into Mike's room. I'm like, dude, there's a cop out there. He's like, yeah, it's Henry. I'm like, what the f- fuck kind of operation he's like he's a client okay whatever shit started getting weird like i said now one day like when the girls would go on dates when they'd fuck and they'd make videotapes and all that we'd be in the bedroom they'd be in the center room in the living room making tapes one day one of the girls she was like the oldest she's like 14 she runs out naked she's like a redhead like all freckly and it looks so fucking I remember being like 20 and it, it, was just, it was so disturbing, even cracked out to see her naked run up like that. And she was crying. He lost, he, he took the tape, he took the tape. Well, we didn't know what that meant, but Eddie and Mike did not like that. When they heard that, they got crazy. Guns got drawn. And these are guys that I forgot to mention are always bragging about dumping bodies in the Florida Everglades. It's like they talk about it all the fucking time. And it was like weird, you know, it was like how I talk about skateboarding. You know, it's like they talked about like how they dump bodies like all the time. And I'd just be like, yeah, whatever. Can I get a new port? Yep, cool. And I'd just go back to my room, you know, but that's the kind of shit they'd be talking about when I'd walk up on them. Yeah, we dumped that fool in the Everglades, you know, shit like that. And I'm just like, so they tell us to go leave. And like at this point, Megan's for sure addicted to crack. I was addicted to crack a long time before that. So I'm just going with the flow at this point. But she's like newly recruited. And like when you're newly recruited to crack addiction, you're like a beast crackhead. Like you're like a fucking straight mutation that was created by other crackheads to perform crackhead duties, you know? And that's what she was. Like, we go to this pool house, and, like, you know, Mike Virgin was like, do not come back until we tell you to, Ryan. Like, you know, and I'm like, okay. And, um, you know, so I sat there with Megan for quite some time. And maybe three hours go by where Megan can't take it you're getting progressively more panicky as the cracks leaving your system. Oh, I got, I need more. I need more. I need more. And that's like the, the big thing with crack. It's like this like compulsion where you need more. Hey, well, you said not to come back. Fuck that. I'm going back. So she goes back. I go back with her, of course. And there's blood everywhere. There's blood on the walls. There's blood on the ceiling. There's blood on the refrigerator. There's blood smeared everywhere. It looked like a scene from the Texas fucking chainsaw massacre. It literally looked like somebody had taken a chainsaw and put it on someone's torso and it sprayed everywhere. Something foul as fuck happened in that kitchen. I don't know to this day what it was, but I saw the little girls on their hands and knees scrubbing it with makeshift rags that they had made out of old white t-shirts and the buckets had gone maroon with sudsy blood and they were just looking at me completely transfixed by their, you know, crack. You know, they had a tube glued to their lips and they looked at me and they couldn't stop looking at me because crack tends to make you transfixed on anything you look at outside of the crack, you know. You're just this weird mutant. It's spawned from chemicals and shit. It's, you know, it's disgusting that humans can get like that with, with substances. And Mike sees me. He's like, you weren't supposed to come back. I'm like, dude, we were there for hours. He's like, you weren't supposed to see this. I was like, oh, yeah, it's no biggie. I acted like I saw shit like that all the time. And he's like, you know, it, you know, it was whatever. But I was thinking to myself, okay, I've tolerated a lot. There's fifth graders smoking crack here. That's awful. If cops ever come, I'm going to be fucked, right? And it's not something I can be a part of. It's not something I agree with. I don't agree with that. I think it's uh, 
horrible thing to do to somebody. These are, this is, this is not consensual, not at that age. It's not consensual at that age. And it's, it, if you are facilitating that, you should, you should get the strictest letter of the law. Uh, life sentences for people like that, for people like Mike Virgin. And so I get Megan in private, you know, because I, I could, I could tolerate the other shit, the, the, the despicable, deplorable shit that he was doing. But you know what I couldn't tolerate was murder. Murder was like, okay, I'm watching these shows where they got forensic evidence and all this weird shit. You felt, when you watch those shows, you almost feel like if you commit a murder, it's going to be like on some satellite projector, like no matter what, like there's no way to get away with it these days. And that was certainly intensified by the crack. You know, I was like, oh God, I'm going to get in trouble. For that. For, this, is a, this is a murder. You know, I'd stabbed that, that drug dealer. You know, I've been around some fucked up stuff, but murder. Uh-uh. This shit that you see in movies, this shit you read in books, like I, I haven't been around it. So I told Megan, I said, we need to get out of here. Like, we need to get out of here now. Like, this is gnarly. You know, this is too much. And uh, she got upset. She's like, we have it good. What are you doing? We're getting free cigarettes and crack. Like, that was some sort of fucking valid argument not to leave at that moment. And it didn't make sense to me. I wish I could joke about it and be like, yeah, well, that makes sense. Yeah, let's stay. No, I mean, I was very adamant about leaving and Megan went and told Mike that and Mike came up to me and Mike said so I heard you want to leave and I'm like I'm just looking Megan like cool you got the Manson family on me now thanks thanks Megan real fucking cool and Mike's like you need to come with me right now I'm like oh god oh you know what I'm thinking Everglades I'm like, where's Eddie? Where's his little Everglade buddy? Like, I'm hit, you know, I'm 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 gonna get murdered right now. It's for hundred sure, percent how I felt in that moment. All jokes aside, I felt like I was gonna get murdered and it was it was absolutely terrifying. And he had just gotten a Ford Lightning truck, and we get in the Ford Lightning truck and he's smoking crack and my heartbeat, the pulse is just doof, doof, doof. I can hear it, I can literally hear it reverberating it in my skull. I can hear the pulse because I'm so fucking scared. And we're driving. And you know what's happening? It, we're leaving the, you know, the, we're, we're leaving this, we're leaving the urban setting. And what's happening is we're getting more into swampy shit. We're getting into the Everglades. That's where we're going. Like I can, I know it. I know we're going to the fucking Everglades. I'm like, oh my God, this is it. This is it. I got recruited by some fucking crackhead kitty porn fucking mogul and I'm hit. I'm done. You know, what was I think? God damn it. You know, I should have never let my parents prescribe Adderall for me when I was a little kid. This just, just it ruined me. You know, I mean, I'm thinking whatever. I'm thinking weird shit. Well, halfway through the drive, he goes to reach for his pocket and he, he pulls out a gun. And I curl in the fetal position and I literally plead like a bitch for him not to, not to hurt, not to shoot me. And I'm curled up protecting my head like that's going to save me from a goddamn bullet. <laughs> you know, it just shows, it just shows like, you know, where I'm at delusion wise. So we start, you know, like, I'm begging him, right? I'm, I'm saying, please, Mike, please don't kill me. And he's laughing. He got this hellacious demonic laugh. <laughs> I ain't going to kill you. Like, really like some psycho shit, right? The way he said it and the way that the fucking car was just hazed in crack smoke, it was so ominous and so menace, you know? He's like, I ain't going to kill you. It's just a heart check. You feel me? And I'm just like, Jesus Christ. This is like, what the fuck? What a weird, okay. What do you need from me, Mike? He's like, look, this guy stole from me. We're going to go and I'm going to handle it. I'm going to let you drive when we get there. I want you to look at the little dashboard clock. It was like maybe five o'clock. It was just getting dark. So if I'm not out by 5.10, 
I need you to speed off. I said, well, why do I need a gun? And he didn't say shit. He just laughed. And we had pulled up to this old, now we're at like a farmhouse that's surrounded by the Everglade, by the swamp. Like the shit that you'd see on that Swamp Thing show back in the day. I mean, like we're in some real, you know, like it, lo- it looks like a place where a Scooby-Doo villain would like dwell you know, like we're in the middle of the Florida swamp. It's fucking crazy. And it's getting dark. And I see him get out of the car and he's got a gun in his hand. I have a gun in my lap. And we're talking about, I think mine was, I want to say it was a 38. It was either a 38 or a 32. It was, it was small. Um, and he had a 45. I mean, he had a big gun on him. And like, I'm not, I, I, look, I, I was raised in Santa Barbara. I'm not used to, to urban shit like that. You know, I'm not used to like packing gats. It's shit that I'd like hear about in hip hop songs and that's it. And that's it. I'm not pretending to be something I am not. And I'm at that point. I certainly hadn't had the exposure to it yet. I see him go in the house. It's like barn type house within like 20 seconds. A guy runs out in his boxers these like off-white boxers. I'll never forget them because okay? it feels like it happened yesterday. And he's running full speed and Mike's power walking behind him just like it's a Michael Myers in a Halloween movie or Jason. He's walking with confidence that very scary killer precision walk that you know is just like, you're, you're, this dude's like, he means business. And he pulled his gun out and he fired this loud, loud shot. I mean, I felt like you could hear it, you know, 50, 60 miles away. It was so loud. And the guy just dropped and it was getting dark enough where all I said, I don't don't know what happened. I didn't know if he wiggled. I don't know if he survived it. All I know is that he didn't get back up. Mike comes running into the truck. Did you see that? I dropped that motherfucker. Yeah, I saw it, Mike. And like, I'm... I'm feeling... Whatever I'm feeling is so intensified by the crack. The heart, boo, 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 is so fucking intense at this point that it's almost muting and muffling everything else out. It's just like, it's like comparable to like a full-blown panic attack adrenaline laced with crack you know a completely all encompassing feeling you know it's something that arrests you and you can't move outside of it the whole car ride back he's talking about how he killed this dude and like he owed him money and like we're talking about like 1500 bucks is what he was talking about you know the guy owed him 1500 and like instantly it became clear to me that he didn't value life you know he didn't value life like I did like life is precious to me but remember it wasn't just a month or two before that it took seeing Allison die where like I really saw how fragile it was because it was like a direct product of shit that I was doing. Like that could have been me. And I, I was going through a pretty dramatic shift in my perception at that period of my life. I've seen people die for the first time. Now we're talking about two, like within the span of a month, I was looking at things differently. And we get back to the house and I say, I came up with an executive decision. I'm like, I'm not going to get fucking Megan's endorsement here. I'm going to take her cell phone and I'm going to find her mom's number. And I'm going to tell her mom what time it is. You need to get us out of West Palm beach. Now, like we're living with pedophile murderers that kill people in swampy locations, shit like that, you know? And I call her. And Megan had always told me that her parents might have an issue with me because their oldest son, Megan's brother, had died of a heroin overdose. The first thing that I said to Megan's mom was, my sincere condolences about the loss of your son. She's like, what son? I was like, 
your son that had overdosed, Megan's brother. She's like, Megan's an only child. She never had a brother. And I was like, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. No, no, no. We're not on some sixth sense fucking ending type stuff, right? Like, but it, that's what it was. She was a pathological liar. She had, she, her, I said, what about the house? Tell me she has a house in Knoxville. Megan li- has been living in our basement the last 10 years. What about her, her husband in Iraq that she was so courageous to leave? She's still married to him. He's deployed right now overseas. What about her job as a fucking nurse where she had become this tragic, mistaken junkie? She's been addicted to heroin for the last four years. In everything in my life, every reality that I constructed in front of my eyes that was projecting every day was completely dismantled and I was disillusioned and I was like, fuck. But I still felt the obligation as a man and as a human being to get her out of that situation. And I went and I talked to her and I said, Megan, we got to go. It's not It's not a joke anymore. It's not speculation. It's not blood they may have put on walls to scare us. It's I saw him shoot someone. I saw the dude drop. You're a fucking liar. I mean, she's on crack. You know, it's like, I, I, crack isn't, what it does to you is, is profound in a really bad way. You know, it's, it's just the worst version of anyone's personality. You know, as long as you're doing it, it's the worst version of yourself. Absolutely. I think that that's one of the most destructive drugs on the planet. And she was very much in the throes of it. And she was not going to listen to me with reason. And of course, she went and told Mike again. And Mike gets a gun and he puts it up to my face and he says, have I not been good to you? You want to leave again? I'm shirtless. I'm shoeless. He has a gun to my fucking temple. And he tells me that he could just kill me right there and then, or I could leave and never come back. And if I leave and never come back, that's fine. But Megan's staying. And you know what? At that point, the gun to my face, that was it. Megan, if she's, if you don't want to come with me, that's cool. And it's not like I said that. I very quickly just said, okay, can I get my stuff, my passport, my shoes, my shirt? No. And I left. I left Megan and I had no shoes. I had nothing, no money. The problem was that my parents were on a cruise to Italy at the time. So I had no resources right now, like straight up homeless with nothing, no food, no nothing, like completely fucked. For the, like the worst I'd been in my entire life on the other side of the country. What are you doing here today? Ah, oh, fuck. Look, man, it isn't what it looks like. I was just here smoking crack. I swear to God, I know that it looks bad. I was just over here smoking crack. That's it. Anyway, Ryan, Chris Hansen here of Hansen versus Predators to catch a predator and have a seat with Chris Hansen. Yeah, I know who you are. Look, Chris Hansen, this is just a fucking coincidence, man. Mm-hmm. Ryan Leone. Why does that name sound so disturbingly familiar? It's pronounced Leone. And, you know, I'm going to go ahead and assume that it's because I've gone viral. Maybe because your secret screen name is Fryin Ryan 69 What do you mean by Fryin Ryan 69 Chris, it's because I like acid. And 69 Call me old-fashioned. It's just some of the silly shit that I'm into. Ryan, I'm going to need you to have a seat right over there. Mm-hmm. On the tanning bed. Okay, look, Chris. I'm going to throw out an idea, and I don't know how you're going to react to it, but let me just try it. I'll suck your dick if you let me go. Mm -hmm. What are you doing over at Mike's house? I told you, smoking crack. That's how I don't think that's illegal in Florida. (sighs) BF conga lines to catch a hot tan dude. I guess that's one of my new shows. Anyway. So this shit's about my tan? I'm going through the transcripts and I see that quite frankly, your tan is far too bomb for Florida. Jesus, man. I really thought that, you know, you thought I was a chomo. Anyway, and I got to tell you, Chris, I think that I speak uh, on behalf of everybody when I say that you're doing God's work. What you do is a service. It's 
goes beyond just entertainment. The world has a problem of pedophilia, and we must stop at nothing to destroy people like Mike Virgin. We must protect our kids. We must put motherfuckers in prison. We live in a society where we treat drug addicts worse than child molesters, and I know that now I'm a father, I don't want to live in a world like that. You are an ambassador to take down the weirdos, and I thank you, Chris Hansen. I thank you, and I appreciate you. I fucking love you. Anyway, stay tan, stay healthy, avoid the virus. Remember, I'll be watching. Thanks, Chris Hansen. You're the best. So I went to a mall and I slept under a pillar. And I woke up to the sun. The, the heat had woken me up. And it's probably 8.30, 9 in the morning. Whatever it is, the mall had just opened. Same kind of um, morning, you know, it was reminiscent of when I was looking for the drugs on my hands and my knees. I'm seeing a lot of normality, normal life, and I wanted it back. You know, I've been in some really weird situation and I'm shirtless and like I look, I'm like half lobster eyes or like half of my skin tone is like bright red and I just look like a complete fucking crackhead I look like what I am you know I think that I had a buzz cut at the time I don't know why but I did I I don't do that a lot but I think for whatever reason I did yeah I did because uh, yeah anyway so um, today I had some sort of weird drive I think it was maybe because I was dope sick this is the first day I'd gone without opiates or methadone or anything for like a while and I'm feeling horrible. And I remember back then you could do 1-800-COLLECT and you could do this old play with 1-800-COLLECT where you could manipulate the operators into tracking people down and to being like your little receptionist. Like, can you look up my uncle Ron in Sacramento, California? It's Ron Minini, you know, and they did. And so they patched him through to accept charges and he did. Ryan I'm like listen check it out let me talk I have been inducted into some pedophiliac cult that has kidnapped my girlfriend is forcing her into prostitution and producing child pornography on a on a level I'm not even aware of maybe it's mass distribution maybe it's global I don't know but I'm involved with some fucked up shit and I need I need to get out of here Ryan it's the most absurd story I've ever heard. And it's like, dude, it's so absurd. You think I would try it? And that made sense to him. I mean, he thought about it. He's like, that story is so convoluted and complex. Either you're a complete psychopath like Megan was, and you make these complex, like catfish, like lies up, or that really happened. And if that really happened, you need to get the fuck out of Florida. And it, Fortunately for me, it was the latter. And he ended up wiring me like 500 bucks, which I couldn't access at first because like I didn't have my ID. I didn't have clothes, so I couldn't even walk into the pharmacy to go to get Western Union. Eventually, I got it all straightened out where he sent a password. I got the cash. I ended up wearing one of those lame Florida tourist shirts that I was fucking making fun of earlier. I swear, I think at the last... At the last, at the last of it, I was wearing like a shirt with like a crocodile on it with like someone's like water skiing in its mouth or some shit. And like, I called TJ, you know, and I had this money that my uncle had sent me. And the first thing I did was have him drop me off a sack. Then I got this motel room. And then I, I, you know, while I was in the motel room, I called him and I said, do you have anyone with a gun? And he said, what do you mean? And I said, I want to pay someone to go handle some shit or I want the gun, you know, like I wanted the gun or to pay somebody to do it for me. And he said he had a guy named Lou. And, you know, at that period, I was watching True Romance a lot. I was watching Love in the 45. Like, I really thought I was on some like romantic, poetic ending shit regardless of the real life consequences that this presented, but you know, it was whatever. And I was down with it. 
And he said he knew this guy named Lou, this real grimy, old, classic New York Italian junkie that would do anything, like a Guido thug that would do anything for some for a fix, not even for cash, for a fucking fix. He shows up in a Cadillac Eldorado, like the most dirtbag Eldorado I've ever seen. It had like three out of four of the wheels were like replacement donut wheels and he had like one nice rim so it was like I think he like actually paid for one nice rim like it's not like all four of like the rims were like intentionally placed and nice I think he had all shitty rims and then he like thought that he could get away with it if he put donuts on the rest of the car to kind of make it look like this used to look tight, but now it's this. Like, seriously, that's how this dude was. If that, if you can picture that. And I saw him and he's like, yo, I'm Lou. He was the most classic New York dude ever. Like, he was straight out of My Cousin Vinny, but like a heroin addict. I don't know, you know? And yo, uh, what, what's the situation, youngster? I'm like, look, some pedophiles kidnapped my girl. I fucking hate them. The chomos, they're fucking disgusting. And I'm like, yeah, they're disgusting. But yeah, they're fucking nasty, bro. All right, yeah, I got a gun, but we gotta go get it. It's in Lake Worth. I'm like, yeah, all right, Lake Worth, cool. So we go in his little donut rigged El Dorado or whatever. We go to this house in Lake Worth. Lake Worth is the fucking hood of Florida. That's where we, that's where, you know, that's where I scored. And like, I was used to, and it was predominantly black. Of course, we show up to this house and there's about 16 black guys. No furniture. They're all sitting Indian style and like some good looking brunette white chick with like 16 black guys. God knows what's going on with that. But there, she was just sitting there. We go in there and like... It was the kind of thing where, like, he knocked on the door and, like, some, like, guy with dreadlocks answered it and he had, like, you know, bloodshot eyes, you know, just typical shit, you know? He sees him, he's like, you motherfucker, you know? And they start going at him, Lou's talking shit to him, and the guy's talking all ghetto to him, and he's like, what, what, what? And I'm like what the fuck is going on? Like he brought me to some black flop house where like, he's obviously hated. We were just supposed to pick up an extra gun for me here. And now they're explaining to me how Lou had boosted a car for crack the night before for them. And then he had an extra key and stole it back. So he was like double downing and like getting paid by multiple crack dealers for the same stolen car. And I'm like, how much does he owe you? They're like three grand and you guys aren't leaving till it's paid. And I'm like, are you fucking kidding? God damn it. He's like, no, it's cool, bro. He's like, dude, just give it like an hour or so and we'll get out of here. I'm like, what the fuck is, what do you mean an hour or so? This isn't what I saw. I'm paying you to do this, dude. What the fuck? Now I'm not allowed to leave? I'm like, there was some real weirdo shit going on at that house. There was like some toothless black chick who was like, I think, I don't know, but it, you know, I think she was like the, the leader of the house. She was like some crazy, like gypsy black lady, like Whoopi Goldberg's character in Ghost or something, but she sold drugs. And she was like flirting with me real hard. And she had like one remaining tooth, like just this like sliver. I don't even know if it was a tooth. It was like a tooth or a tonsil or something. But like you could see something moving when she like had her mouth. Eventually we leave with not one, but two guns, the hot brunette chick and uh, Lou <laughs> and, his, and his El Dorado. And I call Megan and she doesn't pick up herself. So I call my virgin's landline and she picks up and I go, baby, I miss you. She's like, well, I'm in a good situation here, honey. Just let me be. I'm like, nah, I got his tickets back to California. I got a hotel. I got fucking dope. I'm hanging out with this cool ass dude named Lou and Lou's like, you know, like, yeah, I'm Lou. Like, this is going to be good. We got this brunette too. Like he said shit like that, you know, like that would suddenly like sell it to her. But, um, and we had picked up balloons, like li these little, no, the, the pill capsules in Lake Worth too. So we had some dope on us. We had a bunch of dirty needles and, and we were riding around dirty with guns in the car and shit. And I'm trying to convince Megan to pack her shit that I'm going to be there with two guns. And, uh, you know, as soon as 
we get there. I'm going to save her from these predatory sex offenders. And she's going to come and we're going to have this happy ending together. And she said, okay, they're not home. Come get me now. We're probably 15 minutes away. We end up getting there. It's nighttime and the gates open very slowly. Right. And I remember it was like slower than normal. Maybe it was just because of all like the tension leading up to this moment, but like some shit was going to go down. It was palpable. You could feel the tension in the air. Kind of like when you're in prison and like things are really getting like tense with everyone, like a riot's about to kick off. You can fucking taste it. Like it's, there's so much pressure and negative energy. Like you can feel it. And that's how this felt. And we get there. And Lou's like, I'm going to go up there alone, bro. You stay and watch my El Dorado. Like, I was like, okay, like someone's going to steal their fucking one rim, dude. Come on. So I sit there. Sure enough, Megan comes down the stairs a few minutes later and she's got her bags in her hand. I'm so happy to see her like mission accomplished. We didn't have to shoot anyone. It was cool. She comes and she sits on my lap. I think she kissed me on the cheek and Lou's like, all right. Mission successful, let's leave. We fucking pull out and about four cop cars circle us. And Lou's like, oh my God, bro, bro. I'm like, what, man? I'll eat the dope, like what? You know, because I got all these little pill caps full of heroin on me. But we got the needles in Florida, like needles, put you in jail for like months and shit. You know, like they're crazy there. So I knew we were busted to some degree. And then the guns, I was hoping Lou was going to take the guns. And he was like, I want to fucking run for a homicide in 84. I'm fucked. And I'm like, what? He's like, I'm holding court in the streets. I'm going to shoot it out with them. I'm like, nah, dude. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? And I'm seriously thinking that, like, I'm in the worst situation of my life. I mean, I didn't think of that for about three weeks straight. But, like, I knew it at that moment, you know? Like, I'm with this crazy Italian that just doesn't give a fuck. I'm with, you know, this brunette chick who may be autistic. She hasn't said anything since the supposed gang bang that we had just left at the house. And, you know, the cops, everybody get out of the car. Lou's like, I'm going to fucking shoot him. But he couldn't get the guns from underneath the seat. And he's struggling. And by the time that he's struggling, a cop's already cuffed him because he's obviously resisting. I'm lo- And like, listen, I fucking hate cops and I've never rooted for cops in my life. But I'm going to be honest, I was pretty happy that they got him when they got him because I wasn't trying to be involved with some accessory to police murder, you know. And so I had enough time to eat the caps, you know, or at least I thought I did. The Megan got up off my lap and I go to get off my lap because they're telling us all to get out of the car because it's really suspicious. This guy was like resisting and like there's cop cars surrounding us. When I get out of the car, I see my little pill capsule of heroin just fall and I see it, but the cops don't see it. And so like I'm on one side of the car and I like tried to be slick and I got my left shoe and like you know, stomped on it and just kind of kicked it. But what I did is I kicked it too hard and it went all the way under and kicked one of the other cops in the shoe. And he saw it, get on the ground, you faggot junkie. And I'm just like, oh man, it's over. And these straight Republican cops have me now in captivity. The worst scenario ever. And he's like, are there any syringes in the car? I'll fucking kill you if the syringes in the car. You know, these are like East Coast cops, like the worst, you know? I'm like, no, nah, there's no syringe. He's like, I'm going to tase you if there's a fucking syringe in the car. I'm like, listen, there's not a syringe. I'm going to fucking tell you. You know what? He found like seven syringes. He tased me and I pissed my pants. So I'm sitting there. I'm in handcuffs. I was wearing khaki dickies, so you could just see urine seeping through my pants. Horrible. Embarrassing as fuck. And I see that they're not cuffing Megan. She's the only one they're not cuffing. And I'm like, what's going on? Did we just, yeah, we just got set up. We had to. Uh, and I look up, and I see the cop. 
and it was in like Virgin's condo, the one that looked at me when I drank the beer. And I learned a lot, right? Just in that, in that flash moment, I looked at him and he looked at me the same kind of look that he looked at me the first time when I was drinking the beer. And a little bit more of the world made sense to me at that moment. Not everything's as it appears. And there's a lot of really bad stuff going on beyond what my scope of bad even means. Stuff that's a lot more evil and malevolent and exploitative and predatory and inhumane than stuff that we have to deal with in our day-to-day lives because it's in the shadows. And I watched him let Megan go. And I watched her walk off with the cop that was fucking 11 or 12-year-old girls just a few weeks before and videotaping it while I was in uniform. And they cuffed me. And they put me in the back of a squad car with Lou, who was crying. You know, a tough guy that I just watched get completely defeated. As he told me, he's like, I'm, that's it. I'm never going to be out of jail again in my life. I've been on the run since the mid-80s, you know? I'm like, I just didn't know what to say. It was too much. And they found another balloon or another pill capsule heroin in the car. So they, they charged me with possession with intent to sell. And I was looking at years in prison. And I was just watching Lou crying the whole time. And I was thinking about Megan walking off with that cop. And my entire view of the world changed right then. I've never looked at stuff the same since that that period. You know, that has permanently changed the way I look at the world.